Welcome back to Federal Insights, sponsored by GDIT here on Federal News Network. My guests today are Major General Mike Schmidt. He's the Program Executive Officer for Command, Control, Communications, Intelligence, and Networks at the Air Force. And Colonel Bobby King is the Senior Materiel Leader for the Enterprise IT and Cyber Infrastructure Division at the Air Force. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. And before the break, uh, Colonel King, we were going through some detail in what the general had laid out with respect to the three lines of risk reduction. The first one that you described was enter was network as a service. The other two are, and it's all yours. Sure. Um, so I, and I'll go ahead and mention both of them, end user services and, and compute and store. And I can describe what, what each one is. So end user services is, uh, the idea there is everything that an airman and guardian will interact with um, going forward. Um, and so that's the endpoint and the, and the operating system on the endpoint um, and, and the security tools on that endpoint, but also the help desk, both the enterprise help desk and the local help, help desk at, at, at each base. Um, and, and it's also uh, kind of the command and control system. And for, for those that are, in, that are familiar with the IT uh, systems, it's the ITSM. And uh, that, you know, we have a um, ITSM tool that is pretty much uh, the, the central repository that, that uh, has all the information of where things are um, and, and passing tickets back and forth, if you will, between the help desks and, and OEM providers and those kinds of things. And uh, so that's, that's the three major uh, elements of end user services. And then Compute Store. So we already have a Cloud One program that's already... Uh, a program of record, and we have 74 mission systems that are live in those, in those uh, two cloud service provider environments um, that, that we mentioned earlier. And, uh, but there's, there's some elements to uh, working with the cloud that we wanted to explore in a risk reduction effort to augment and, and improve that enterprise pro provi uh, uh, provided cloud, Cloud One. Um, and so we awarded an OTA for Compute and Store and the idea there was to have a single pane of glass uh, that, um, that allowed uh, the vendor partner and the Department of Air Force to see everything going on in the cloud um, and as well as get after the um, on-prem um, disconnected ops types requirements uh, that, were, what, that were provided to us from our lead MAGCOM Air Combat Command. Yeah, so that's a pretty wide range of services and products. And this idea of user experience, which Major General Schmidt mentioned, and also that's one thing to measure. The SLA adherence is another thing to measure. And then there's the speeds and feeds, which have to underlie all of that. So those three elements are related, but they're not really the same thing. And so how do you get at what is good user experience? I guess you have to ask the users, but I would think it's situationally best. Uh, right. Because uh, if someone is involved, say, in an exercise and you're simulating a combat situation, you know, a millisecond can be a long time or 10 milliseconds can be a long time. If you're sitting in a data center watching to make sure things are operating quickly, you know, a couple seconds may not be such a big deal. So tell us more about that, Major General Schmidt. Yeah. So, I mean, you touched on some really interesting things. So, so what's right for uh, for uh, you know an airman at one base uh, and and they work just fine uh, might not support a mission uh, at another base uh, based on the technology needs. So so you know what what Bobby's getting at what relative to enterprise IT as a service um, you know I would say we are trying to capture the enterprise level requirements that would be the common denominator in general across all bases at the same time. Uh, um, he, he has a number of teams both actually we do both on on uh, on Bobby's collateral side and our on our classified side uh, of going out and, and and right now we're doing these ABMS experience experiments or JADC2 uh, demonstrations uh, at various places around the world and we're sending our teams out uh, to to really um, if you will uh, help trick out those bases uh, you know, even though they might not be risk reduction basis for IT, ITAS, uh, we know they have a, a kind of an ancient infrastructure uh, that relative to those special needs, uh, uh, whether that be on SIPR or NIPR uh, in terms of data flows to support those mission requirements, 
Uh, we do have teams going out there and, and really trying to help those bases on an individual basis. We don't want to do it, uh, uh, you know, base by base by base, you know, per experiment, because what we're identifying is we have problems at those bases. Uh, Ms. Knossenberger, the SAF CN uh, and ACC Air Combat Command, our, our lead command for, for IT, um, they, are, they are out there um, putting together scorecards uh, across all of our bases because, like I said, you've seen one base, you've seen one base. And, and for very specific missions uh, that are at a certain base, we need to understand the IT infrastructure that they're dealing with relative to the mission set that, they, that is tied maybe to that base or that area of operations. Uh, so those are great questions, hard to answer. And we found out the best, the only way to really understand it is have, have a, a team of, of uh, really sharp people that understand our, our, our IT infrastructures across the Air Force, go out to those bases and put eyes and hands on. Uh, and, we're, and we're really seeing some, uh, some quick wins at some of these bases that, that we didn't, you know, maybe we didn't know before um, why they seem to have so many problems. And, and uh, um, so it's been really helpful uh, kind of tying these these ABMS or JADC2 experiments or demonstrations um, to some of our IT infrastructure things that, that we're trying to get after. And along those same lines, you're probably aware that the Air Force um, really is on a, uh, a DevSecOps mission to completely change the way we do um, you know, uh, development, specifically software development across our weapon systems and, uh, and our mission systems. And, and so we, there's a lot of exciting things going on in there, whether it's uh, IT delivery, uh, whether it's putting tools into cloud, uh, specifically uh, uh, digital engineering tools. But what we're really finding out is at those locations um, where they're trying to do DevSecOps, one of the limiting factors for them to be really successful is often the IT infrastructure that those DevSecOps tools are running on at those bases. So, you know, between some of the efforts we're doing in JADC2 uh, and us trying to make our, our either program offices or, or other, other uh, weapon system development communities successful, uh, we're out there identifying um, challenges uh, in their IT infrastructure relative to using those, those DevSecOps tools. And, and again, we're capturing all of that in lessons learned and in these scorecards, and ultimately, as we move forward in enterprise IT as a service, I think it will really shape how we get after, you know, whether that's the network as a service part uh, or the or the compute and store part of that. Um, you know, I think that really helps us. I think we got a pretty good handle on the end user services part of that, and what we really need to do going forward. Uh, so think, you know, as Bobby talked about the help desk. Uh, you know, uh, you know, whether it's tier one, tier two, tier three, or even better tier zero, where, you know, you have uh, bots kind of helping you as, as we're starting to get used to, you know, outside the Air Force, you know, I, I'd rather have my pin reset uh, by myself going through some scripts than me having to wait on the phone for someone for a while and go through the basically the same thing, uh, you know, with a, with a, a human being. Uh, and then the end user devices, we definitely found out we had a total hodgepodge of end user uh, devices in terms of capability of those devices. Uh, and now we, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna have a common standard uh, with, a, with an image uh, that is uh, really um, uh, balanced between security and user experience. So we've kind of all, you know, that's a long way of saying, I think we're, that's why we're gonna move forward with end user services uh, as our first production part of enterprise IT as a service. Uh, but, you know, all those other things I mentioned um, you know, we're capturing those lessons learned into enterprise IT as a service. So when we move forward with production for those lines of effort in enterprise IT as a service, um, I think we have a, we'll have a much better vision uh, for, for what right looks like in the future. Sure. And while you can't let the lunatics run the asylum, is the end user part of the feedback and evaluation mechanism that you use? So Tom, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to add in a couple of things in that. So the Air Force, Department of Air Force saw fit um, that end user experience was so important that they actually hired uh, a chief experience officer. His name is Colt Whittle. He has deep uh, industry experience in that area. And uh, for this risk reduction effort, we worked extremely closely with Colt Whittle um, to figure out how best to get after measuring end user experience. And, and so he, uh, 
working closely with him, we have sent out surveys throughout the Air Force. Uh, the ones for the risk reduction effort, we focused on the eight bases that we're um, experimenting at. Um, and he helped us greatly with that. So yes, we have asked questions, both uh, you know, pre-COVID, we did face-to-face -face interviews uh, with a lot of the users there, uh, both before we took action at the base to try to improve it. And now we monitor that. So we go back and ask questions periodically to track that end user experience. And it's interesting, uh, I don't wanna get into the, you know, some of the findings necessarily, um, but uh, we did find that right after COVID hit, uh, some of the, uh, the metrics went up because there was so much focus on getting telework working. Um, and, and we greatly improved telework capabilities within the Department of the Air Force. And, and so, so those numbers started to creep up. Um, and that was quite interesting to, to watch. But yes, yeah, so we, we do ask those questions, uh, both written and face-to-face uh, -face questions. The other thing uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, we've talked about SLAs. And so that's a piece of it too that uh, will eventually be in the production contracts that we're experimenting with uh, in the OTAs currently. Um, so, so that's the, and, and so when you, and then of course you talked about requirements earlier too. And so we have a requirements document that's very close to being finalized for production. Uh, we had an initial requirements document from our lead manscom. Um, and you know, Air Combat Command is, is producing that requirements document. So yes, all of that stuff has to work together. And we work very closely with both the SAFCM, which is the Air Force, Department of the Air Force's Chief Information Officer, as well as the Lead, lead Manscom uh, Air Combat Command uh, to, to make all that work. And also, we've been talking about DevSecOps, and the middle name of, Dev, of DevSecOps is security. And how does security fit into all this? I mean, in one sense, you could say, well, it's integral to all of these activities and user experiences, data storage and compute, et cetera. But on the other hand, it can also be treated as a separate discipline and domain as itself that you can farm out parts of or do yourself. So how does the security and crypto piece fit into the whole scheme here when you consider managed services and how to reduce the risk in using them? So I, I can start off uh, on that one. So, you know, I, we talked a lot about it a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, you know, security is foundational to everything. And it is, it, it, it remains a healthy tension uh, as we bring these commercial capabilities into the department. Uh, there, there definitely is a prove to me uh, that we are in a better security uh, situation with these new technologies, or, or at least not in a degraded security situation. And so there's a lot of time out there spent proving. For instance, um, and we have a very good partnership right now uh, with, uh, with uh, SAIC on the compute and store side, who's standing up the, uh, the ESOC, so the Enterprise Security Operations Center or the ITAS and Security Operations Center, I've heard, I've heard uh, both. Uh, but um, uh, anyways, but as you can imagine, uh, while they're trying to, uh, they are working, you know, we have, they are, they are required to have partnerships with those other companies, uh, so Accenture, uh, Microsoft, AT&T, to bring that security posture together and have this Enterprise Security Operations Center. And ultimately, um, we're trying to prove out you know, whether or not we think we can have um, you know, a contractor uh, basically take over a lot of that work, still with oversight by, by the 16th Air Force and, and, and government people, um, but, uh, you know, that is a huge part of these day-to-day -day conversations. And, and again, we have a great partnership with the 16th Air Force. They are very much watching this, uh, watching this closely. Uh, but, but, you know, naturally, everyone is very cautious to make sure that we're not going to give up, you know, any keys to the kingdom, uh, you know, unintentionally. And, and so those, those discussions are, are really hard. Uh, and, uh, and they really require close partnerships and people sitting down together day by day and building, uh, and building trust. Yeah, I was going to say that really seems to be perhaps the most important element in all of this is that you can trust the people you're working with externally and I guess internally also, but that would be more of a given. And so what are some of the types of things you talk about with managed service potential providers to kind of get that simpatico and the feeling that in your gut, you can trust what they're going to do with you? Yeah, I, that's a really hard question and a good one. 
so we do have regular meetings. So, so uh, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So um, you talked a little bit about requirements early on and, and the requirements in this space are really, you know, Bobby talked about some of the actual written requirements. Um, but as you could, as I'm sure, you know, in IT, everyone thinks they're a requirements officer in IT. In fact, I, I joke a lot, you know, this is my fourth, uh, fourth uh, uh, opportunity to serve as a PEO. And I tell everyone, I think they put me in this job because I was the biggest whiner about IT. So they, they said, well, you're going to go do this then. Uh, and um, uh, anyways, um, the, the real requirements officers in this, this space are, are at least technically, uh, you know, SAF CN, Bobby mentioned, so Ms. Knossenberger, uh, Brigadier, General, Brigadier General Chad Radigy at ACC is the A6 as the lead command uh, for for in this space, uh, and working with uh, with us, the the you know the PEO on, on many of the programs, and we are together literally uh, at least every other day, if not every day, and so um, so that kind of a partnership right off the bat is really really important internally, and then um, uh, with those those uh, you know, contractors that we've mentioned, we meet with them on a regular basis at all levels. So, uh, oh, I should have also mentioned, Bobby's team who runs this is not really just Bobby's team. So it's really a tri-headed team. There's a, uh, it's called an integrated uh, program office, uh, the IPO, and it's literally SAF CN, ACC, and our PEO team running that organization. That's a really a new concept. Uh, you know, it is it is a, a, a joint team working with these contractors every single day. So it's not just the partnerships and the trust with our contractors. It's the partnerships with the users and partnerships with the policy community. And that's how this whole, whole um, program has been set up. And honestly, without this integrated program office concept, we would, in my opinion, wouldn't be close to as far as we are today because there are there's no finger pointing allowed here. And, and, uh, and that's kind of taken, uh, you can say there's no finger pointing allowed, but there's really no finger pointing when you make them all the same organization. And, uh, and so I, I think that's, uh, that's just great. So hopefully that helps a lot, a little uh, to your really hard question about how do you build those partnerships? I don't know of any way to do it other than spend time with people every day and, and somehow get rid of the finger pointing. You know, it's ultimately something is somebody's fault or somebody needs to go fix something. Um, but it doesn't help a lot to say, you know, um, we're going to stand over here and tell you go fix that thing. So uh, we're trying to get uh, to break down those barriers. And, and I'm really proud of the, that whole uh, integrated program office team uh, that has kind of led that with our contractor partners. And Colonel King, so you mentioned that you have OTA with some of the vendors to try to work with them and figure out what this is all going to look like. What is it that in your mind says, okay, we can move from OTA to a standard procurement for the long term? What gives you the confidence that that's what you can go to next? Because once you're in with managed services, you really want continuity for a significant period of time, I would think. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I, I can't talk about the details of our production contract here. But yes, I mean, longevity is something that, um, that is important to us. And it's why we took the time and the effort and, and spent the money to do the risk reduction effort so that we made sure that we got that right uh, with the SLAs, with the contract, with what we're going to do first and how it all ties together. Um, and, and, and so that was very important. And, and, um, and, and so as we move towards that wave one contract um, next year, then uh, that that all come to fruition for part of the, you know, I mentioned the elephant at the beginning. Uh, it, it's quite a large undertaking. And so there'll be future waves as well to get after the rest as the risk reduction learns the lesson. So that's kind of, uh, I think, probably what you were referring to. So the, as we've gone through the risk reduction over the last couple of years, uh, we determined uh, that helped us understand how to approach it. Now, we did a base by base level uh, approach in the beginning. We're going to do eight bases and those kinds of things. And one of the things we learned is we should have done the enterprise services first. So that once we get to a base, the enterprise service is already established and we can um, uh, add the base in much easier in a much shorter timeline. And so that's, and there's many lessons like that. That's just one example, one big example uh, that we learned as we move into production. Uh, yeah, longevity is a consideration as well as we do that uh, going forward. 
and Major General Schmidt has said, if you've seen one base, you've seen one base. But as you develop and get confident with these services, uh, managed services over time, then perhaps they can be replicated from base to base to base. So it's a little less of if you've seen one base, you've seen one base. And that also can lead to maybe that budget stability in the long run that you mentioned when things are a little bit more standardized for standardized services that are not necessarily tied directly to the specific mission of that location. Fair enough? Yes, uh, and, and the, the fascinating part about that is if, if you're able to standardize, then that opens up a lot of efficiencies, um, opportunities to, to save both dollars and manpower and running those base area networks. And so when, I, when we talked about network as a service earlier, that includes the base area network, but it also includes the wide area network. Now, uh, DISA provides wide area network for, you know, the act. So we have that we're just experimenting with that piece, but we've learned so much by doing that. And also built our relationship up with uh, DISA, Cyber Command, um, and NSA in that conversation as well, as we talked about earlier. But, um, but yeah, so if you can um, remote access to a base area network that looks like all the other bases um, and, and make changes remotely from an enterprise location, um, then that, that, that is, that, that is uh, really nirvana uh, going forward. And when we get to that piece, but um, you know, we're not going after that first because we still have some lessons we need to finish learning the risk reduction effort. And Major General Schmidt, you get the last 15 seconds. Yeah, I, the one thing we really haven't talked about in all of this is uh, we, are, we are, as we move forward into production with any of these capabilities, we are looking for continuous competition and flexibility in our contracts. So, you know, while we won't necessarily be using OTAs, we have learned that we want to partner with these contracts, but we contractors uh, in the best in the commercial industry, but we need off ramps. And so, so we are definitely uh, building in the flexibility into our contracts in, in competition. And, uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of where, where this, this team has, has gone and, and we do have a long ways to go. And, uh, and it's really exciting times in IT. All right. Well, we can uh, check back with you in another year to see how it's all going. Let me thank today's guest, Major General Mike Schmidt, as the Program Executive Officer for Command, Control, Communications, Intelligence, and Networks at the Air Force. And Colonel Bobby King is the Senior Materiel Leader for the Enterprise IT and Cyber Infrastructure Division of the Air Force. I'm your moderator, Tom Tem, and you've been listening to Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, please visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search GDIT.